All rise. Hello, I'm Mark Curry, a retired trial court judge with more than 34 years of total courtroom experience. In this video, we're going to be talking about the topic of the closing argument. It is arguably one of the most important phases of a trial where you put it all together for the court or for the jury. And in this video, I'm going to be giving you some strategies and techniques for how to do an effective closing argument, as well as my own trial tips I've learned from my years of courtroom experience on how to do a very persuasive and effective closing argument. Let's get going. Before we begin, I'd like to just give a little brief disclaimer and kind of caution about how to use this video. What in, in this video, really, I'm going to be summarizing information uh, from my handbook called the Practical Trial Handbook. As such, I'm not giving any type of legal advice. Furthermore, the rules of evidence or the cases I talk about or the law, um, you need to confirm that it is the current state of the law and the rules of evidence followed in your own jurisdiction. And lastly, remember that the trial tips I'm giving and the strategies and advice of how to become effective in the quorum or in, during trial work are only my own opinions. And other judges or other trial lawyers may disagree and have their own viewpoints. This is just my own opinions of how to become an effective trial lawyer. The closing argument is probably one of the most important phases of a trial, whether it's before the judge in a bench trial or the jury, because this is your opportunity to wrap it all up, to put it all together for the fact finder. And so it's an, the importance of it is that during the trial, uh, evidence may have come in in, dis, in a disjointed manner, meaning evidence, witnesses may have been called out of order, um, you may have established some points that may not have been very clear to the jury or the court while you established them. And so you could, be, this is the culmination of all the facts and evidence that you've produced that's been shown in the trial. And the trial may have taken a few days or it may have taken a few weeks. So that's the importance of the closing argument. It's your opportunity to argue uh, how you've either proven your case if you're the plaintiff or the prosecution in a criminal case or how you've defended it and how the other side has failed to prove their case, the weaknesses of the other case, if you're the defense uh, in a civil case or in a criminal case. Even in, uh, even in family law cases, um, you should think about, or small civil hearings, uh, you should think about having at least a brief closing argument uh, where you can wrap it all up, summarize your points, and argue your point of view. The beauty of the closing argument is really there are very few restrictions. In fact, the law basically accords the attorney's wide latitude. And that's uh, uh, been in almost every jurisdiction. You have very wide latitude to argue your case, your points of view, to the court or to the jury. And in a few minutes, uh, towards the end of this video, we're going to be talking about misconduct. And I'll talk about just how wide it is and how um, there are very few rules, but there, there are some areas where you can't go into and there are some areas of misconduct that, occur, that, occur, that it can occur during the closing argument that we'll talk towards the end of this uh, video what might require an objection. One thing I just want to point is that's the importance of the closing argument, even in a bench trial or court trial. Many of you, it may not be before a jury, it could be just for the judge. As I mentioned, it could be a short one-day family law trial or a guardianship trial, uh, or a probate trial where it's just the bench. And a lot of attorneys tend to kind of shortchange the closing argument then. Uh, and I would say that you should not do that. Uh, one of my trial tips is, uh, is that don't shortchange the closing argument in a bench trial just because it's before the court and not the jury. And what I mean by that is that the judge still may not understand all your uh, arguments or how it all comes together. And so if you, before you waive, some attorneys, if it's a bench trial, they'll say, Judge, I'm good. Uh, you know, no, I, I waive or um, I won't make a closing argument. I would say be cautious to that. Having been a judge myself for many years, uh, I knew that even in a two or three day bench trial where I have to make decision, I liked a closing argument where the attorneys could kind of summarize their points. And sometimes I'd even interrupt and ask questions. I also note in some jurisdictions, uh, the, the judge might even allow the party to submit written closing argument. And as a judge myself, I like that because later back in my chambers, I could read their arguments. But I also like the combination of a little bit of live uh, argument at the front end, and then they submit their briefs a month later or two or three weeks later. I reviewed it in chambers and I issued a written ruling. So that's the importance of the closing argument. I have a couple of trial tips related to that, and that mainly has to do with preparation. 
Um, the preparation for your closing argument should not occur the night before. In fact, a good uh, trial uh, preparation is that you're already thinking about your closing argument as you're putting your case on, as you're, as you're preparing your case long before trial. So um, one of the things you should be thinking about when, when prepping a closing argument is this trial tip. When preparing your argument, you should always assume that during the trial at least one or more of the jurors or the court was not paying attention, were confused, or were doubting your theory of the case. The argument is the time to distill the issues, to simplify the facts, such that every juror and the court is on board. A common mistake occurs when trial counsel wrongly assume a point was obvious. Your closing argument should be designed and delivered with those doubting jurors in mind. In other words, don't assume Everybody understands what your case is about. Don't assume, that even though you feel you've established some points and it's very obvious, if there's 12 jurors up there, or even the judge, don't assume they all got it. Go back over it in your closing argument, explain how you proved it or disproved it, and don't make that mistake, that mistake uh, of assuming that something was obvious and that they all got it. Um, another, here's another trial tip that I think might help you. And that is, um, some lawyers miss important points for arguments simply because they do not keep good trial notes. Keep a notepad handy at your counsel table to jot down um, some points you'd like to later cover in your argument. Otherwise, you might forget. So when I was a trial lawyer for many years, sometimes I did that. During the trial, I might have established some really good points, maybe on cross-examination, there's some nuggets, some little facts that I thought, I gotta bring that up in my closing argument. And if you didn't write it down at the time, if it was a two or three day trial, by the time of the end of the trial, you might forget. And later in your closing argument, it would be a shame if you had established some really good points, but you neglected to talk about them in your argument because you didn't keep good notes. So keep good notes, um, have a notepad over there, all the little nuggets and things that you wanna bring up, put, to get, put it all together in your closing argument. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about the importance of visual aids and exhibits in your closing argument. For example, a PowerPoint-like uh, presentation. You know, many studies have shown that when people and jurors uh, see things and hear it simultaneously, they have a much higher retention rate. And so that's why I think that even for the smallest of cases, even if your trial only lasted a day or two, during your closing argument, use a PowerPoint-like, I say PowerPoint-like because there's others out there and I'm not endorsing any particular one, but where you can slow, show the jurors slides with bullet points and have your slides track your argument so the jurors can see the points you're making point by point as you go down through it. I mean, here's a, here's a trial tip in that regard. When you are displaying your PowerPoint slides, politely remind the jurors that they are not permitted to have your notes in the jury room Therefore, they might consider taking their own notes. You'll be surprised how many jurors take heed of this advice and scribble down info from your notes as you're proceeding through your argument. Note that it is not an uncommon request from a deliberating juror, uh, jury to get a transcript of one party's closing argument, which is obviously not allowed. So my point is, since the jurors aren't allowed to have your closing argument back in the jury room, um, you might want, if you remind them, um, if you tell them that point and suggest that they might want to take notes, you're not going to tell them what to do because that might offend them, but you're going to suggest that during your, my closing argument, some of you might want to take some, might want to take some notes because I'm going to be talking about some um, important things. You'll be surprised. A lot of jurors will pick up their notepads and as your closing argument is going on, they'll be taking notes. And that's very important to have, when they have their notes back in the jury room, they can remind themselves of what you said in your closing argument. So that's a good tactic to use. So as I mentioned, there is no particular exact formula to follow for a closing argument. Obviously, it depends on the type of case, the length of the trial, but let me just kind of go over a basic format. As you're preparing, you might want to think about the areas to hit. How you want to structure it exactly was really going to be up to you. And it goes to a lot of um, strategy. So first of all, you're going to want to have some, uh, you're generally going to want to start out your closing argument with some introductory comments, um, thanking them for being attentive, and then give, them a, give the jurors, or if it's a bench trial, the court an overview of what your theories were and redefine the issues. In your, in your opening statement, you probably told the jurors, 
or the court, this is what the elements of the charges are, or this is what the cause of actions are, or this is the defenses that we're going to be uh, uh, raising in this case. So re, um, redefine them. Go over them one more time for the jurors right at the beginning of your closing argument because you want everybody to be on board. As I mentioned, the worst case would be that you've got half of the jurors understanding what you're talking about and half of them don't. And that goes back to my original um, trial tip about always assume one of the jurors is doubting your case as you're putting your argument on. So you're going to have introductory comments. Then you're going to have some section, some uh, component of your closing argument where you're going to be talking obviously about the evidence. What was proven? What was disproven? Um, you're going to be talking about what your evidence proved or disproved. And then at some point you're going to weave in what your opponent's evidence, the weaknesses of your opponent's case were. Um, why your opponents failed to prove this or that. And then obviously a component, a subcomponent of that is going to be, you're going to be talking about witness credibility, which witnesses were believable, which witnesses weren't, and why. And then at some point, uh, another area you're going to be talking about, obviously, is going to be the law. So you're going to, if you're the prosecution, for example, in a criminal case, you're going to be want to talking about the elements of the charges and what has to be proven. If the defense on the uh, uh, other side of the coin is going to be talking about what elements were missing or were not proven. Obviously in a civil case you're going to be talking about the cause of actions, what's got to be proven to show negligence or, or uh, wrongful conduct and the same flip side is on the defense what hasn't been proven. So you got to um, have the law talking about the elements, the cause of dis dif uh, uh, actions and there's going to be, need to be some talk about the burdens of proof. Again, depends on the type of case. We all know criminal case beyond a reasonable doubt. Civil case, generally a preponderance. Family law, it could be a middle ground. I know in, um, for, against, for example, in juvenile dependency cases, it's clear and convincing evidence. So you want to make sure the jurors understand what the burdens of proof are, what the levels are, uh, when you're arguing what has or has not been proven. Uh, you might, if it's a civil case, obviously you're going to be talking about damages. Uh, which is always interesting in a plaintiff's uh, argument how they're going to approach damages, uh, particularly for non-economic, where it could be for pain and suffering. So you're going to be talking about uh, the damages that you've proven and give them a format of how to calculate them. Lastly, the last kind of uh, part of your closing argument is going to be the concluding, where, in my opinion, you should just um, summarize what you've already covered one more time. Uh, you know, uh, because it always is a good tactic to say it more than one time and sometimes say it a little bit different way because as we all know and I know it's been proven in memory studies that repetition helps people recall and you really want the jurors to have a good recollection of what you just told them in your closing argument when they go back into the jury room later on in the day. So now we've kind of, that's, so that's, that's just kind of a general format of the areas you need to cover in your closing argument. Let's talk about the delivery though, because sometimes um, how you say something can be just as effective in as what you say. So here's some points uh, to be thinking about, about how to deliver it, how to say it really. So the first one is I call pace. Almost all people when they're nervous, and I'm probably doing it now, speak too fast. And that's usually, that's a very common fault is you talk too fast. And so slow it down. Um, and uh, think about taking deliberate pauses at certain places, the pregnant pause as they say. You may work up to some dramatic or important information and pause and then give it because that really captures the juror's attention. It makes them think something important is about to be said. And so slow it down. Number two, I call it a little emotion. What I mean by that is don't just read a script uh, because it'll be obvious that you're just reading um, from a playbook and that'll tend, it'll make you seem more monotone and less interesting. And so you need to have a little spontaneity about it. Um, I have a trial tip here in a moment, and that is um, about how to maintain spontaneity, and that is use a deep, during your argument, use a detailed written outline for the argument that, that you can refer to periodically as the argument proceeds. So it's always good to have an outline in front of you. If you're using a podium, you can look down on it, so you need have some reference to help you kind of stay on track because even the best, most polished lawyers can get off track or forget things 
And so that'll help you in outline. Now, if you're using PowerPoint slides, you can even use your own PowerPoint slides as your outline. Kind of like I'm doing right here. Right now, I'm using PowerPoint slides to help me kind of keep on task and moving forward. So my, my, uh, my trial tip is use a detailed written outline for the argument that you can refer to periodically as the argument proceeds. This will help you remember important points and to stay on task. On the other hand, avoid reading it like a script or the argument will seem, seem canned and it'll prevent you from having some spontaneity. So that's what I mean. A little bit of motion, in other words, get a little bit passionate about your argument, minimize your note or reading, and that'll kind of keep it interesting for the jurors. My third point is how it flows. When you're structuring your argument, you want to make sure that it goes from point A to point B. Because one fault I've seen some lawyers do is that they'll start down the path of an argument and then it won't be linear. In other words, it'll kind of jump around, go from point to point, that may digress um, and kind of not seem in order, so to speak. And all that's going to do is confuse the jurors and it's going to make it harder for the jurors to track. So have it, have it flow in a logical method from point A to point B. My last kind of point is simplicity in time. So I'm not, I don't want to denigrate jurors or even the judge, but you need to remember that um, I keep it simple. If you start talking over their heads, if it's a jury trial, you could have very educated people on the jury with high intellect. You could have people that are not so well versed in uh, intellect or the law or maybe in um, whatever era you're talking about. So I, I tell jurors, again, I mean, I tell attorneys when I've lectured to them to try to keep it about a sixth grade level. And again, I don't want to insult anybody, but you want to capture everybody's attention. Keep it simple. Break in the point sim simplicity. In other words, so don't make the argument too complex and be careful about speaking over the jurors' heads or even the court. Uh, remember about court trials, and I've heard many of them, is that the judges are very busy. And this could have been the second or third bench trial the judges heard this week. And sometimes if the attorneys want to present their written argument and the judge has to revisit it a couple weeks or uh, you know take it under submission, as we call it, it's difficult for the judge to remember, remind him or herself what the trial was about. So that's why you need to work and keep it simple, keep it organized. And um, about time, uh, my opinion is the shorter is off, the shorter argument is often the better. Keep it concise. Of course, that's in, that's my theory overall about how to present a case effectively at all aspects of a trial. Is often the attorneys tend to over try their cases. They put on too much evidence. They argue too long. And the point is, is that you, you lose the jurors or even the court. So in your closing argument, be conscious of the time factor. You're, you're up against what I call the time clock, which is the jurors limited attention span. So if it's a, just been a one or two day trial, you know, your closing argument could be 15 or 20 minutes or even less. If it was a long, complex trial, you know, some closing arguments can go on for days. But again, you're running the risk that you're overstating things, you're going to bore the jurors. And trial tip is, is you're giving your argument, look at the jurors occasionally, or even the court, to see how they're doing. If you start seeing jurors yawning, looking at their watches, staring up at the ceiling, you know that you've lost them. So keep it simple, watch your time, and make it efficient. So here's a couple of trial tips that might help you. Uh, most, most trials boil down to only one or two key to contested issues or facts. Identifying those for the jurors or identifying for the jury these key issues will help you to stay focused on what is important and to prevent them from going off the track in the jury room, which does happen and does happen frequently. Another trial tip is the art of persuasively weaving together the facts and the law is a skill that separates good lawyers from the great ones. So the really, really polished lawyers, the good ones, are those you're talking about the facts, but then you're also weaving in how the facts are proven or disproven, and you're kind of weaving the two together. Uh, my last trial tip in that regard is predicting and deconstructing your opponent's case before they argue can also be a good tactic. In other words, you're stealing your, your, your opponent's thunder. So one tactic I've seen very effective is that if you go first uh, and uh, you ha maybe have a rebuttal, is that you predict what your opponent's going to argue and you tear down their argument before they even stand up. That can be a very effective uh, trial tactic. Another trial tactic is 
during your closing argument, assist the jury by suggesting to them an approach or a method for organizing and then analyzing the evidence. In addition, direct them where to find important evidence, for example, specific exhibit numbers or page numbers and documents or uh, that you referred to that were shown during the trial. So this is really important because there are really no specific directions of how to deliberate. In, in, in almost every jurisdiction, the jurors are given a lot of latitude about how to organize their, uh, their review, their deliberation of the evidence. If it's been a two or three or four day or a couple week day trial, they'll get a pile of evidence with really no instruction book, no playbook about how to deliberate, um, how to organize it in any kind of fashion. So a good trial tip and a good tactic you should use is give them a method. Again, you're not telling them to do it because you don't want to offend them, but you're suggesting to them that, hey, during your closing argument, you might want to um, organize the evidence in your deliberation this way. And when you do suggest to the jurors where to start or how to organize the information, you might be surprised after the trial is over just how often they followed your advice. Another good trial tip uh, regarding the argument is, a good argument is one that is redundant without seeming redundant. For example, saying the same thing a slightly different way to make the point. This might help with jurors that didn't make the connection the first time. It kind of goes back that generally redundancy is a good thing. The more time the jurors hear it, the more likely it is they're gonna retain it and understand it. So a good argument would make the same point uh, perhaps different ways. One time in your introduction, one time as you explained it, the meat of your argument, and maybe a third time when you summarized it, you re-emphasized, restated the most important key issues uh, and your theory of the case to help the jurors get it. All right, so that's kind of the overview of the argument. Now let's talk a little bit about misconduct and the latitude that you're permitted during a closing argument. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the courts allow wide latitude, but there are limits. And I thought what I might do is share with you a little bit of what some courts have said about the latitude you're given during your closing argument. So here I'm gonna quote from several cases. Quote, the right of counsel dis to discuss the merits of a case, both as to the law and facts is very wide, and counsel has a right to state fully his or her views as to what the evidence shows and as to the conclusions to be drawn fairly therefrom. The adverse party cannot complain if the reasoning be faulty and the deductions illogical, as such matters are ultimately for consideration of the jury. Um, counsel may vigorously argue his or, her, his or her case and is not limited to Chesterfieldian pol politeness. That refers to Sir uh, Chesterfield was a um, uh, from the 16 and 1700s back in England wrote a list of rules of how to uh, be polite. So the courts have said you're not limited to Chesterfieldian politeness. Uh, so that means you can be pretty vigorous as long as you don't personally denigrate opposing counsel. Um, and here's a, another quote from a, co a court. It says an attorney is permitted to argue all reasonable inferences from the evidence and only the most persuasive reasons justifying justify handcuffing attorneys in the exercise of their advocacy within the bounds of propriety. So the point I, is that um, when we come to misconduct, um, you are permitted to argue your theories, you can argue your interpretation of what the facts showed, you can argue your, inter your interpretation of what the law is. But where you can run into an objection is, and the most common one I found, is when counsel misstates the law or misstates the facts. And I'm talking more than just their interpretation, but outright misstates the law or facts. So for example, during the closing argument, if your opposing counsel literally misstates the elements or gets the, the law completely wrong, then an objection might be uh, well taken at that point where you would object, your honor misstates the evidence or objects, your honor misstates the law. Obviously, if counsel completely has misstated what, what the evidence was at the trial, then an objection might be appropriate. Another objection that, might, uh, that typically would apply generally is that if an attorney or a counsel tends to make more of an emo emotional appeal. In other words, you're asking the jurors not to follow the law or the facts, but make, it, make a verdict or a decision based on sympathy or passion or pity. 
uh, or for some societal reasons to, to make a point uh, or something to that effect. That would be prohibited. Another rule, uh, a prohibited area of um, argument is called the golden rule. And essentially that's where you're asking the jurors to put themselves in the place of the victim and see the case through the victim's eyes or the plaintiff's eyes and what they had suffered. Obviously it could be misconduct for counsel to make personal um, disparagements about opposing counsel, personal attacks, that kind of thing. Now in criminal cases, um, prosecutors are held to even higher standard due to their ethical duties. And we're not going to go into all of that. That's really beyond the scope of this short video. But just to kind of summarize some of the more common ones are that prosecutors are um, prohibited from commenting either directly or impliedly about the fact that the defendant chose to exercise his Fifth Amendment right to silence or that he invoked his Miranda rights when he was arrested. Um, prosecutors can't vouch for witnesses. In other words, they can't make it seem as if they know something about the witness that the jurors don't or vouch for their truthfulness or make their own personal opinion about what they think about the evidence since they're basically agents of the government. And lastly, prosecutors can run into trouble when they make an argument that seems to shift the burden uh, to the defendant or water it down. So those are just areas to keep in mind and again, beyond, a little bit beyond the scope of this videotape. One of the questions you might have is if you're, you're sitting there and you think that your opposing attorney has misstated the law or the facts, do you object or not? And this is kind of more of the tactical reasons. The first thing to remember is that the objection must be timely. So you can't wait until your opponent completes his or her argument and then make an objection or a complaint. It has to be timely, meaning right when it happens. As soon as you hear counsel misstate the law, objection, your honor, counsel's misstated the law. In some jurisdictions, if there has been an error or misconduct or, uh, and the judge sustains your objection, you must also make a motion to have the jury admonished, an admonishment. Uh, your Honor, I would request uh, to please admonish the jurors to disregard counsel's statements on, to that effect or something like that. Some jurisdictions require a request for an admonishment in order to perfect the issue on appeal. So one of the uh, trial tips I have is whether uh, to object during your opponent's argument is a tactical decision and depends upon the severity of the transgression. If counsel has blatantly misstated some fact or law, an objection might be in order. On the other hand, if it is relatively minor, repeatedly objecting may not sit well with the jurors. Whether or not you have a rebuttal argument still to come would also be a factor, obviously. And my final trial tip in this regard is a failure to make a timely uh, objection, as I just had talked about a few minutes ago, um, can have a significant impact on how the appellate court treats the alleged error. In addition, a failure to object is a, a common ground for IAC in criminal cases. Uh, what that means is if you don't object or you don't make a proper objection, the appellate court down the road uh, will deem it waived, forfeit, forfeited. And also in criminal cases, if let's say the prosecutor committed misconduct and you and the defense attorney did not object, then on, a, on appeal, one of the common attacks is that, his, that the defense attorney was incompetent for not objecting. So there's a lot of reasons why you may uh, or may not object. Again, it generally is tactical. Uh, and the specific types of things that relate, for example, to criminal cases, again, are beyond the scope of this handbook. So that pretty much completes my this short video on the closing ar argument. I hope you found it helpful. If you want more information or more detail about what we've been talking about, please visit my handbook called the Practical Trial Handbook. It's available on Amazon Books. And in that handbook, I cover a, a trial, either a court or bench trial from beginning to end, from the motion in limine all the way through to the closing argument like, we, like we've been talking about now and everything in between. Jury selection, motions, opening statements, cross-examination, how to put on evidence, uh, how to impeach a witness. All of those things are covered in my handbook with, and it's full of trial tips like we've been talking about today of things I think are important that you really can't find in the more formal trial handbooks. So see the links below if you're interested in the handbook. Also, if you like this video, please give it a like and visit uh, and subscribe to my channel because I'm going to be putting out more videos, short videos like this to kind of complement my handbook. And thank you very much for your attention and good luck in the courtroom.